Welcome to the Golf Lovers United podcast. I am Ben Golf Lover UK. You can find me on Twitter and you can find me on Instagram. Be nice. Don't be horrible. No need. <laughs> and I'm joined by my partner in crime, my PIC, PGC Pro Golf Critic. How are you, my friend? What's going on, Ben? Think things are going well on my end. Um, again, a lot going on today. Just uh, finished listening to Jay Monahan's press conference, sort of State of the Union address that he does every year to the players. Like every time I hear that guy speak, it just gets me really, really riled up. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to restrain myself, so I'm, I'm gonna sort of pass the mic off to to you again before I say something I should. Yeah, back off, back off. Right. I all I'm gonna say is I watched nine minutes of it and. I do not understand how Xander Shoffley came out with a quite a, a, a strong comment about basically having no faith in Jay and then others said they've got faith in him. I do not know how anyone has faith in him. I, I'm not getting into PJ Tour versus Liv. I don't care about any of that. And frankly, we shouldn't be saying PJ Tour versus Liv because it's actually some leadership versus other leadership rather than actual tours. But Jay Monaghan, when he talks says an awful lot of words, but actually says nothing. Yeah. It's really PJ tour against it itself at this point. Like that's really what it's come down to. Um, I think everybody needs to, to realize there are going to be two separate entities that move forward at this particular juncture. Like there's, there isn't going to be a coming together of things. Like we're going to have these two distinct brands. The PJ tour is not going to, they're not going to change. Like, if this was going to happen, there was going to have to be compromise on their end. It's very clear that they're not willing to compromise. Um, and I think that that's that. Like, I, I don't think it's any more more complicated than that, unfortunately. So, you know, I feel bad for the people that, that wanted things to sort of come together because they're sort of PJ Tour stands and like they want to see the PJ Tour be as uh, good as it can be. Um, I'm sort of on, on the other end of the spectrum. Like I want to see what live can become. And I, I think you and I sort of share that, um, interest. And I think that's really the most important thing to me at this particular point, because I have watched the PJ tour for 25 plus years. I have been very critical of them specifically the last 10. Um, and it's just clear to me that they're not willing to make any of the changes that I want to see. So if if I'm going to a local shop that like I've been loyal to for a long time and they refuse to make any of the changes that I want and there's a new shop that that comes along that's giving me a lot of what I want like I'm going to wind up going to the other shop that's just part of the deal so and I'm not saying everybody is like like me but I know there's a lot of like uh, like-minded fans so yeah that's just kind of where thing things are now right Bearing in mind, you weren't going to say anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't okay. say anything specifically Stop. about the press conference because Stop. I could go deeper, but I'm not going to. Stop. <clears throat> right. My computer is being crazy. Right. Here we That's go. Okay. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about? I think a few people have said they'd love us to start the show at the top of the show, say a little bit what we're going to talk about. So we're going to cover off a bit of Liv Jedder and my trip, not do too long yeah. on that because many people have heard about it. I want to talk about his tendency now for more and more players to lose their cool. Obviously, we had Lowry with the with the club um, throw and the kick, and then we had Wyndham Clark with a gouge and Rory with a tee box and with a putter. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, Hong Kong. I want to talk about Bay Hill. Um I'll touch very quickly on DP World Tour with Matteo Manassaro. Um, I'd like to cover a little bit about um, Anthony Kim. And maybe we can start just a few minutes more on Jay Monaghan's speech. Just very quickly. I know what we've said and, and what you're saying, but was there anything you took from it that gave you any indication of anything you didn't know? Or was it more just more confirming what we thought? Yeah, th I think it was all pretty much confirming what we thought. Um, that's the thing about Jay Monahan's speeches and sort of press conference. There's never any new information really uncovered. Uh, you know, I think the only good part to sort of come out of this, and this is something that I sort of tweeted about earlier today, <laughs> was 
they sort of confirmed something that I uh, was suspicious of and pretty much confirmed it. So um, I've sort of been on this block that I felt like the PJ tour, their sort of marketing s- spin machine, they are obsessed with like sort of trying to create new stars and new stories all the time. Like you see it every time a new player wins. It's like, this is your flavor of the month. It's Jake Knapp. It's Nick Dunlap. It's Matthew Pavan. Like who, whoever it is, like there's always, last year was Max Homa. Like there's always going to be these guys that, that like win or win a couple events. And like all of a sudden, Oh my God, they're the new superstar on tour. And it's like, that's, that's not how superstardom works. Like these things have to grow over a very, very long amount of time. Like if you look at any of the global stars in golf yeah. now, whether it's Rory, John Rom, DJ, Cam Smith, whoever it is, Bryson Brooks, whoever it is. Can I, can I these say these guys the have, that... they've been developed over a long period of time, but they have been developed. But can I just say something that really irks me now? I'm not going to deny that live have taken players from the PGA tour and a DP world tour that have been established and taken them to live. I'm not going to deny that. that. That that's inarguable, but the PGA tour they weren't. They didn't give birth to the players. They came through the Corn Ferry Tour. They came through the college system. It's not like the PJ Tour built these players. And it just annoys me that comment. Yes, they've given them a platform to develop and grow on, but but this we create players. You don't create anyone. Like no. th- these players have all come through. Tell me a player. Tell me a player that plays on the PJ Tour in the last thirty years that didn't either go to college come through the Corn Ferry Tour or come through the DP World Tour or one of the other feeder tours. There isn't anyone because it because well, the, it has always been the top tour. So it's always taken other people's talent and they're yes. just annoyed now that that's what's happening to them. Oh, 100%. That's what um, all of the, the sort of animus is really about. And the thing is, like most of these guys, like in order to get to, to superstardom, it's not just their performance on the PJ Tour. It's their performance in majors. That's the thing that gets them to like that, that very top echelon. Because if, if you take, you know, a, uh, a Brooks Kepka and you take away his five majors, guess who he is? He's Patrick Cantlay. Patrick Cantlay is not a superstar. He's just not. So these are very distinct levels to this. And it's something that's like very, very important that people need to like uh, keep in mind because it wasn't that long ago. It was, you know, uh, 30 years ago that like, the majority of the, the stars in golf actually played on the European tour. So it, it wasn't like the PJ tour always had all of the talent. Like this has been something that's been, uh, that's changed over time because the, the PJ tour has been where the money is and it has attracted players from all around the world because that's the whole point of professional golf is playing where the money is. So, and now that's not the case anymore. Live obviously is a very important tour for that that reason and these guys are realizing more of their actual value on live than they did on the pj tour you just, so, you just actually raised something very interesting and oh and, and a slight segue you recently you use the phrase people play where the money is can i just read you an article from golf digest in 1996 i know where you're first going in the, first in the minds of many fans right or wrong it creates the impression that the player is playing in the event solely because he's being paid to do so, says Fincham. This raises the question to the extent which he, he is committed to trying to win the tournament or play well, as it happened in tennis, and if he misses the cut, can create a nev- negative perception. Second, a tournament that pays players to show up is inherently putting a cap on the level of stature it can achieve. That was um, former PGA Tour leader. Mr. Fincham are talking about Fred Couples. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh. So Fred Couples, this is quite interesting, actually. I'm just going to read a little bit more. So there are a lot of people who talked about how you shouldn't go and play for live because it's guaranteed money. Here's some names, randomly some names that said you shouldn't play for guaranteed money in an article about being paid guaranteed money. Uh, Greg F- Nick Faldo, Greg Norman. Greg Norman's not against it. Nick Faldo was, was quite vo- vocal about it. He he used to be, his charge was $150,000 an event. Not my words. These are the words of Golf Digest, uh, November 1996. So if you have a problem, 
go and speak to Golf Digest. Fred Couples, it's, they say that his average tournament payment was 125,000. This Jack Nicholas was paid 100,000. Tom Watson got paid. A few of these people have made comments about taking guaranteed money. Davis it's a bad Lowe. narrative. It's Davis been a bad Lowe. narrative this yeah. whole time. That's the thing that gets me really, really fired up is the fact that it's hypocrisy, Jay. Yeah. It's hypocrisy. It was <laughs> okay for me... them. It was okay Nothing... for them to take money. <laughs> Nothing grinds my gears more than hypocrisy. Um, it's something that has been part of this deals from the beginning. It's been part of the reason why I've gotten involved in this conversation because I've called it out from the start because I've seen it happen. And this is one of the bad talking points that's been out there from the beginning is, oh, Guaranteed money in golf is bad. No, it's not. It's it's literally one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life because they've all been getting all the stars have been getting some form of guaranteed money for as long as as, as long as pro golf has been. A thing and most life. most sports tell me, uh, does Cristiano Ronaldo not try because his salary is guaranteed? Does Lewis Hamilton drive poorly because his salary is guaranteed? It's stupid. Does Dak Prescott deliberately throw another interception in a playoff match, which we should be winning because his salary is guaranteed? They all compete no. with guaranteed salaries. Anyway, we're not going to talk about it. Right, let's move on because we've done it to death and it just gets in both of our tits. Right, move <laughs> on. Right, where are we? Um, let's talk about my trip to Jeddah. So let's do it very quickly. I've, I've done it to death. For those that haven't heard it on other podcasts, I've been on about three or four others and just not done on ours yet. I had a great opportunity to go out to live Jeddah. Royal Greens is a absolute bucket list course. And my, 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 my one criticism about Royal Greens, it's only got three holes on the, on the, on the Red Sea. It's got 14, right. sorry, 15, 16, and 17. To only have three holes on the Red Sea is a travesty, but yep. bloody hell, what are three holes, especially 15 and 16. It's yep. an incredible course in condition like nothing you've ever played. You come, you play 10, you play 10, which is a, a lovely par four. If, if, if it can be described as anything, it's actually quite an easy par four. <laughs> you bang it up the left-hand side, the wind's going to take it left to right. It's a little bit shielded because of the mounding of the ground. Right. And it's a nice, easy, accessible green. You're feeling really good. You get to hole 11, it's a 140-yard par three, playing 200 yards into the teeth of a wind uphill to a green that's got three tiny plateaus on the actual green the course is incredible and i, I had a great time I met, I met so many players i talked to i said hello and spoke spent two three four minutes and so many players players everybody knows about i again got to i got to chat with bryce and i had 15 minutes chatting in one evening just an engaging man to, it just he loves if you have any doubts about bryson's love of golf you really need to reassess. Bryson loves golf like fish love water. It is unbelievable. His passion for golf is just, it's just another level. And I love watching him. Like if you watch him walk around, he bounces. He's so excited just to be around golf. Like I got, I imagine if he wasn't good at golf as a player, he would have ended up being at a range, working as a coach or something. He just <laughs> loves everything about it. Yeah. So good to spend time with players. Um, real surprises of people I got to spend time with. Like, uh, Anibal Lahiri. What an amazing guy. What a great fun bloke. Um, shout out to the live guys who got us out, who, who got us out there, um, allowed us to be there. It was, it was amazing. Um, look forward to hopefully being in Valderrama and doing live UK. Just really, really good time. Have you got any questions, Jay, that I have maybe not have touched on? No, I feel like we, we've actually talked about, about Jetta yeah. pretty much till, till the cows come home. Um, I, I will say one of the biggest um, complaints that I think that you and some other folks have had is the, the fact that it's not uh, the course Royal Greens isn't necessarily in Jetta proper. It's like it's kind of an hour away. North, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, in a town called King Abdullah Economic City. Um, now, me personally, and this actually is a, a great segue to Hong Kong. Um, I have an affinity for, and I men mentioned this uh, during the Hong, Hong Kong uh, uh, broadcast for Live, and it, it was actually featured on, on the Live broadcast I, I saw. 
I love golf courses that are sort of around a proper city. And actually, Don Boulay corrected me. He, he was like, well, um, Hong Kong Golf Club isn't exactly in downtown Hong Kong. It's it's kind of on the outskirts. But it doesn't matter because yeah. there's buildings around it. There's been sort of a city that's been constructed around it when you have this, this great piece of property that's been there for a long time. Um, it's something about golf courses that I really like. And unfortunately, Royal Greens doesn't really have that yet. But that may happen do. at some point, it but we'll, we'll see. They, they, are, yeah. they are building a behemoth of a hotel. So if I'm looking at the Red Sea and I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking up. I'm on Seventeenth Green, looking at Seventeenth T to the water to the sea. They are building a hotel that I don't know. Maybe sleeps four billion people. It's absolutely <laughs> massive, and I've been right. told that in Cake, as they refer to it, King Abdullah Economic yeah. City, in Cake, they are they are going to be building that up to make it a family a family destination, a bit like some parts of Dubai. They're going to mm. be putting in um, theaters and yep. um, small um, a small um, theme park. Things, things like that. So they're yep. going to turn it into that. And I think this, the, the, the talking was they might put another golf course in. Mm-hmm. But look, we, we've done Jeddah to death. I just thought having not covered it on our own podcast was a little bit weird. Yep. And the one thing I would say to anyone, if if they watch the event, is I don't think the cameras, it's not Liv's fault, because it's, it's a bit like Augusta. You know at Augusta, like, the first thing everyone says is the cameras don't tell you the undulations. Oh, yeah, for sure. And the level changes. I honestly, I, I having watched that Jeddah event once on the DP World Tour and twice on Live at, at Royal mm. Greens, yeah. I thought it was relatively flat. Bloody hell! Right? No, it's yeah, it's not. Right. And, and, I, and I think sometimes you don't get that image of there. It's 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 rolling fairways and obviously all man made. It's it wasn't natural, but right. it, it doesn't come across. And I wondered just how many courses. That is the case for, and I think when I watched Hong Kong, and we'll go to Hong Kong now, I think having been to Jeddah and conscious of how the undulations and the elevation changes were there, I think I was trying to look for it at Hong Kong, and I wonder if because I was looking for it, I saw more of it at Hong Kong, because it feels like Hong Kong's got a lot of elevation change. Yeah. Well, some some of that is some of the camera angles too, and sort of like they're – where signature holes is number three, which is the downhill par five that like you've got the the city view in the background. It goes, it plays, you know, 60, 70 feet downhill. You get to see the entire fairway from the tee. Uh, things like, like that, you're, um, it's a lot easier to sort of see those elevation changes, but there's other holes where you couldn't really tell. And it's all, um, it's just so hard uh, for cameras to do it justice unless they're, properly positioned and, and really show the whole thing, which is where some of those, those drone shots can help too. Um, except, yeah, I, th- I think that came through on the broadcast on, on certain holes, but other holes, not so much. So let's talk about very quickly, the winner in Hong Kong, a winner in, winner in uh, Jeddah was um, Neiman. Yep. Absolute Waco. freight train runaway. One by four. And obviously, yeah. And yeah. And, Top five the, player. and the, and the crushes, on the team event coming from behind, which let, and then let's go into Hong Kong, crushes one the team yeah. event again coming from behind. Yeah, I don't think people fully get just how important this four players counting is on the final day. Yes. It, no, it's critical. I, I, it's something. I, 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 know, I know you're yeah. a four aces guy. I know you're a four aces guy. I think um, Pat Perez at times has, hasn't always fired quite as well as he could do. Um, yeah. I'm not saying he's the weaker link, but in the last yeah. four events, we have seen Pat Perez or Harold Varner not have a great final round. So if you take yeah. the four race, you've had the same with Torque. In many events, you've either had Ortiz or Mito Pereira not have a great final round. You know, I think this yeah. is what we've seen. But with the crushers, all four players are are having great final rounds. You know the one thing about the the aces that I got to mention, and I got to call call them out because I was looking at this after Hong Kong, and I was like, "Wait a minute, is this right?" The four aces lowest uh, ranked player in the standing is, is actually Patrick Reed. Patrick Reed has not really? been playing well in these first four events. He's he's forty first in the standings right now. <laughs> so if Patrick Reed is going to play that bad, the four aces are not going to be a top two or three team. They're just not. 
I think you pretty much know what you're getting from Harold Varner and uh, Pat Perez and DJ. DJ is always going to be there every event. I need to see more from Patrick Reed. He's been the weak link so so far, unfortunately. Okay, so Hong Kong, excuse me, Hong Kong. Oh, oh. <laughs> you can tell by my voice, I'm I'm slightly dying, but there we are. <laughs> um, it was interesting, interesting for sure to see what happened with um, Abanza, and he won it. Mm-hmm. But let's yep. call a spade a spade on this. He struggled that last day. He had a collapse. He yep. went in with a five-stroke lead and did his very best to throw it away. I actually think that the best thing that happened for him was that he got to that playoff. I know it sounds daft because if he didn't get to the playoff, then obviously he doesn't have a chance to win. But my, my point I'm trying to make is that I'm talking for the rest of the season because I think if he had just faltered, he could have. And these things do affect you. You do get muscle memory. You do get scar tissue. I think even if he hadn't, even if he hadn't have won the playoff, I think getting to playoff and having another chance was very important for for him and his positivity moving forward. Yeah, you know, I think it, it reminded me. I mean, this just goes to show you that, like. Uh, people say, oh, it's hard to put together four good rounds, you know, on uh, 72 uh, in 72 hold <laughs> tournaments. It's actually very hard also to put together three great rounds on live uh, because uh, this sort of last the problem with the last day. This isn't the first time we've seen it last year. Tier Laguch, um in um, Adelaide, I mean, he had a huge lead. I think it was like seven shots or something, something like, like that. Uh, through the first uh, two rounds. I think he she shot like, I want to say 62, 63 last year. Um, and then that last day he wound up shooting over par um, and he had to kind of squeak out the win. Like this isn't, um, I don't think that uh, that's necessarily a surprise. I think that um, everyone sort of, uh, that last day, this it's just a little bit different. Like, whether it's four rounds or, th- or three, it doesn't matter. You have that little bit of extra pressure of having to perform because you know this is it. You have those people behind you that are nipping on your heels, and all of a sudden, you make a couple of mistakes, you let some other guys into it, you get more pressure. Like, that's really what uh, professional golf is all about, whether it be a major championship, whether it be live, whether it be PJ Tour or whether it be a minor league event, it doesn't really matter. Like that pressure is something that um, it really sort of uh, transcends tour. Uh, I was glad to see him. I mean, it showed a lot of men- mental fortitude because, you know, similar things happened to Joaquin Neiman that last day in Mayakoba. Like he struggled a little bit, wasn't quite as sharp as he was earlier um, in the tournament. And he had to show men- mental fortitude to get it done. Um, Abe answer had, had to do the same thing. And I think that there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and every player that's able to do that and sort of, uh, get that win when everything isn't going their way is a really, really important thing. And something people need, need to sort of keep an eye on. I think we both said that I was talking the other day to someone that I'm building my bucket list of, of courses and where I'd like to play. And, Obviously, obviously, I'm very lucky being in, in, in Great Britain. I get to play so many of the great Lynx courses. And I know you guys don't really have proper Lynx courses. You've got abandoned dunes. But let's be honest, it's not true Lynx in many ways. It's just by the sea. I mean, it, it's, it's kinda... pretty... Um, having experience true Lynx courses in Scotland, I, I think abandoned dunes is pretty much as close as you could get in the United States. But it's States, as close as you're going to get in America. And also, like you haven't got much of that, let's be honest, if you really you haven't got many of those types of courses. So no. I'm trying to think of the course I can play and want to play. And I've put Hong Kong on that list. Now, that is on oh, there for, for sure. sure. Like, yeah. I think I've put Hong Kong on there. And actually, one of the things I'm really enjoying about Liv is seeing some different courses. Um, like Adelaide, yes. like seeing Adelaide, like I think I'd love to play there. However, yeah. if you did play Adelaide, you wouldn't get to play the course that Liv plays because they take the they take their two eighteens and make them into a different mm. eighteen. So you'd have to play yeah. both eighteen separately. But look, 
I, I think that I'm enjoying seeing some different courses. Now, a different course and a, and a different area. I just want to touch on the DP World Tour and Matteo Manasero's oh. first win after after 11 years. And it's been a while. I know yeah. you're not watching much in DP World Tour, but no, but I know Matteo. <laughs> I, I know his story, and it was good to see him. Uh, break yeah, through, so it's good. I, I think that having not won for 11 years, it says so much, and I just think that. I know that we're in danger, you and I, of sometimes making everything about a live comment. And I'm, and I, and I'm very conscious. I don't want to do that. But yeah. what annoys me is when I saw some of the comments about Ian Poulter and about GMAC playing well, about Stenson playing well, having said they're washed up, right? Yeah, of course. And then when Matteo Manassero wins after 11 years and he's an older player, it's somehow treated differently and like, for me, if you win a golf tournament or you play well in a golf tournament, it's great. Well done. And I, yeah. I am absolutely delighted that Matteo hadn't won for 11 years. And, and all the comments you see from all the old European golfers, like European golfers, I say old, anyone sort of 35 to 50 who, who played them when he was a younger man or, or played them just after they joined, everyone to a man is absolutely delighted he won. Just over sure. the moon. Yeah, just because I think whenever you have someone that is a someone people see as being like a young star player that like because uh, he was very highly regarded, you know, 10, 11 year, years ago when he won the BMW PGA as a I forget how, how old he was, but he he was very young. He was in his like 24, 20s, 25, was he something, something like that, maybe even yeah. uh, younger than that, but. Uh, yeah, like he had a lot of potential. Like I heard a lot of people, you know, back then comparing him to like Rory and like other really great European players. And I, yeah, he had the big Sergio comparison, didn't he? Mm, yeah, Serge Sergio is another one. Yeah, yeah. Like he, he's a great, he was a great player, sort of early on, and it's just part of the deal. Sometimes, like you lose it. Um, except it's always in there. Like you just have to, it's all a matter of if you can rediscover it, just like we're, we're seeing, it's a great segue, uh, talking about Anthony Kim, like Anthony Kim's kind of the same, uh, same way. I actually heard, you know, Colt Nose was, was actually talking about this on, uh, flushing its, uh, podcast, uh, how he actually called Anthony Kim other than Tiger Woods, basically the most talented player he's ever seen. So whenever you have anyone saying that about you, like that means that you've got something else in there. Um, I've heard similar things about Mateo when he was younger, that he was like really, really talented. I never really uh, followed him that closely and can't really say if uh, I don't think he's quite at that level of like one of the like, like a generational talent, but I think he's a very, very good player and he's always had this potential to do well. Um, I'd love to see this sort of springboard him into doing more things and, you know, the way things are going, maybe, um, uh, Italy seems like a good market that maybe Liv wants to get into. Like Matteo might be a good target for Liv if, if he can continues his progress. So we'll, we'll have to see how that, how that goes. But it, it was, it was good to see that. And I, I was looking down the DP world tour list and, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull him up. Um, yeah. On, on, on the system. So a guy called Jordan Smith um, finished yep. in second place. And I wanted just to... He's good. And I wanted to touch on Jordan Smith and, 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 and what's going on with him at the moment in DP World Tour. Because actually, it's very, very enlightening. Um, Jordan may be surprised here is talking about him, but I wanna, the reason I'm talking about him is I want to talk about what it's like to be a professional golfer. And... Jordan's having a kind of a good year in some ways. He's got a second place, but what's incredible is how how people earn money. So Jordan's played in five events this year. He won in, in the Hero Dubai Classic. He won forty four thousand euros at the um, Ras Al Khaim Championship. He won zero in Bahrain. He won seven thousand euros. The SDC Championship, he won zero. And last week, he won 101,000 euros. So people, people here see that big 101,000. But let's say he'd finished 10th. He would have maybe got 40,000, 45,000. And then all of a sudden, with the travel and the paying the caddies, it is tough being a golfer. And 
I find it illuminating. And I think I don't know. I don't know how you can do that for a career in so many ways. And I don't, as in just the bravery to to go out there knowing how how you've got to earn your spurs and how you've got, how you, it, it's, it's a hard life to dedicate to, isn't it, Jay? And I think that's why yeah. people were so excited about live with bigger prize money and, yeah. and guaranteed money finishing a lower down. And yeah, I think that's one for me. I think that's a great positive about live. It allows people to go out there, play their game and not worry. You've got young people like Caleb Surratt and Eugenio Shakara, David Pugh. You can go out there and just focus on playing good golf and not worrying about shout out to, Shout out to Eugenio, a friend of the show, and great showing in Hong Kong. And I look at people like Jordan Smith and go, look, Jordan's 10 years younger than me, so he's 31. And I look at it and go, it's, it, it, isn't an, it isn't an easy life, is it, Jay? No, not at all. Like, this is something, uh, especially if you're, um, if you have more of a global schedule, like, that travel all of a sudden is, like, pretty, <laughs> pretty intense, uh, you know, which is part of the reason why, like, if you were going to have a global tour, like it's got to be at the level of live because you have to have, you know, people that are financially secure to sort of travel around, around the world. You have to have higher prize funds. You have to have some sort of infrastructure that can support that. Um, I've never really felt, um, and this is some, something that look, if, if, uh, you disagree here, tell me, but I never felt like the European tour was necessarily set up to be the global tour because I felt like th there's obviously very little guaranteed money. The prize funds are not nearly as high as they, they will be on the PGA tour that could potentially fund some, something like this. Um, and the Asian tour is kind of in the same boat. So um, I've always felt like those two entities needed to collaborate more uh, because you're able to be a little bit more regional where you can have like the sort of global tour where you have the European side, which, which is more of like the the it's almost like the uh, sort of you call it Western Conference almost. And then you have mm. the Asian tour is the Eastern Conference like um, and then you have players that primarily play in those regions. Uh, so you could cut down on the travel a little bit. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm not necessarily sure if that's ever going to going to happen specifically, but you know, I definitely think that, uh, uh, yeah, it's a tough life. Like if, if you're traveling across time zones, like, like that week to week, like it's a very, very difficult thing. And jet lag is a real thing. And sort of being away from, from home is a real thing. Like all of the, these things like impact, the way players play golf. So, um, and it's something that, that needs to be a consideration for sure. Yeah, it's, um, it, it is tough. And like, we look at uh, Stuart Manley, who came, Stuart Manley who came on the show um, at the start of the year, right? So Stuart came on the show. He just, he just won his, um, he just won his tour card back. I'm not sure if you remember Stuart, yeah, of course. Stuart's story, full, full story, but Stuart has played five events so far. He played Bahrain, he played Qatar, he played Kenya, he played SDC, and he played Johnson Workwear. And Manners has earned three thousand four hundred thirty-nine euros in five events. Now you cannot tell me that that three thousand four hundred thirty-nine is covering flights to Bahrain, Qatar, Kenya, SDC Championship. I can't remember where that was. That was at South Africa, I think it was South Africa, and then another event. Yeah, it was, and then the Johnson Workwear in South Africa. Like, yeah, that's yeah. You're it, losing it's money. It's a tough life if you're. Yeah, you're losing money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but some it's people hard. like that. Like some, some of the, these folks out there, they love that fact that oh, you can actually playing a professional sport, you can like lose money, and I'm like, I don't. Me personally, I want to know that, like, if I'm watching an event, uh, that these guys are being, they're actually being paid to show up, number one. It's a big one. Uh, because if you, you miss a cut, you don't get any money. Like, that's like, I've always had a big problem with that because they are providing entertainment. They're providing value to that event. And they're not necessarily getting anything out of it. So I just, um, I just looked and Manners has won 10,000, 9,000 euros from 10 events. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough life. I really hope Manners can, can turn that, that form round and, and start to cash some checks because he's a good bloke. 
you, that point you made there about about um, players providing entertainment. Now we know why the PGA Tour have done it. We know why the PGA Tour. Sorry, excuse me. I've got a dreadful cold. Excuse me, everybody. I, I'm sorry. Coughing, spluttering everywhere. We know why the PGA Tour have done that. They've given a the guaranteed stipend of five hundred thousand, and then you take gets taken off your winnings. And we know why they've done it. But I'm not going to. I don't care that they've done it in reaction to live. I'm just really happy they've done it. I'm really happy they've done it. And I'd love to see the European Tour say, "Here's a hundred thousand pound for everyone who's got a European Tour card. It's just a stipend of hundred grand, and we'll take it out of your winnings." I think they've, say, they've started they doing providing that. Providing it. Yeah, I think they. I think they said. I can't remember the dollar value. I think it was maybe one hundred fifty thousand. The European Tour have done that, have they? If they've done that, I've missed that. I'm, I know. They've, we know they've I'm done it on the sure PGA did. Tour, but I don't. I don't think they did on the DP World Tour. I think they did. I think they did. We can ver- verify, but uh, I, I think it was a, again, a reaction, a domino effect to oh, the PGA Tour is doing this thing, DP World Tour has, has to do it, do it too. I think that that. Uh, just got instituted this past year, or or maybe it's for the for the future. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure you're right. So DP again. World Tour has announced a record prize fund. Da, 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 da. The DP World Tour will guarantee 150 thousand next season. In later response, new earnings program will see exempt players receive money if they play a minimum of 15 events. So if you play 15 events, you will get 150 thousand dollars in the same way as a stipend for your winnings to come out of. Okay, so. I feel yeah. less bad for manners, and I feel less yeah. bad for anyone else who's not winning money. So at, le- at least, at least, at least, they're covering their costs. <laughs> but considering how much they have to travel, they travel way more than the PJ Tour does. So it's like for the PJ Tour that, to have they, it, they, yeah. they they do travel in bunches though. So the DP World Tour yeah, did fair. go to South Africa for three events. They did go to the Middle East for four events. So while yeah. you're right, yeah, they, they do tend, they do go to. So they went to Kenya and then two in South Africa. Yeah. And they had just done yeah. four in the Middle East. So they're, yeah. they're hopping around when they're there, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. The part of the problem, though, is that sometimes you're only qualified for like one of those events. So it's like you have to sort of come in and go out. Like a lot of those fields are sort of like you don't know who's playing in it. Like you don't know if you're going to get in. Like if, if Rory shows up at Dubai, guess, guess what? If you're on the priority list, you're not getting it. What so, if uh, Michael Jordan's yeah. mate gets called up and shoots 174 over par and you don't get to play? Mm. We, again, I'm still furious about that. Right. Before we get furious know, yeah. and start breaking things, <laughs> Shane Lowry, put one in the drink, <laughs> threw his club, then tried to kick it and missed it. Rory <laughs> got angry. <laughs> well, he, he, he kicked great. at it. Rory smashed a tee box, tee marker box. No video, but we got some really great audio of that. That was yeah. amazing. Wyndham Clark, with for me, one of the most unforgivable gouges out of a for golf course. Mm. Having yeah. given it two days earlier, the big one about memories of Arnold and all of that stuff, and then going to... If Arnold had been there, he'd have torn strips off him. <laughs> and then Rory with a little missed putt and putt gouge into the green. Now... I've lost my temper on the course. I've, 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 oh. I've had three. I've had three, I've had three eight irons reshafted, Jay. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I don't do it on the course. I'll slam it into my. my um, I'll slam it into my bag. I now don't put my rangefinder in the front pocket. It goes in the top pocket, clipped on, because I slam it into the front of my bag. If I'm gonna break in, then I break my stuff. <laughs> I, why? Why are we? I know. I know. Someone said to me as a reply. They don't think there's more of it. They just think we see more of it. And that's fine. I understand that. The more you look for something and the more something is televised, the more you see. I get no, that. I think there, there's more of it. I, but I actually think there's, there's more of it. it. Yes. And my theory has been, especially on the PJ Tour, there's just been just this, this something in, in the ether. There's just like a general frustration there's like things are unsettled people don't know what the future is going to look like like this seeps into people's mentals it really does where do you it's think like, it's yeah. giving up the guaranteed money do you think it's like having shaken hands on a deal and then said you're going to go and they're not going do you think it's being offered 50 million 
and asking for 100 being offered 60 and then <laughs> and then saying no do you think do you think these things i'm not i'm not putting any i'm not saying that's what happened to shane and windham i'm not saying that at all do you think that is what's happening to people they're getting angry maybe not knowing what's going on i think that's part of it i think other people like they just kind of have a track record like i know windham has definitely had a, a track record for just uh sort of losing his cool on, on the golf course um i definitely think and that's actually he's performed pretty well early in the season. Like he, he won up pebble and 54 holes. Um, came second like he, at Bay Hill. Well. he came second to Bay Hill. He played great golf. But, but yeah. Yeah. Second to Bay Hill. But yeah, he's probably been the top player on, on the PJ tour this season. Um, so I think that that's part of it. I do think that there's also this, like, uh, look, if, if I was Wyndham Clark and like, I basically gave up 60, uh, 50, $60 million guaranteed. I'd be pretty upset about it too. So, like but he's on, he's Jay, obviously going to do very well for himself. Hang on, Jay. Haven't they got these 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 fake shares they can't sell? Yeah, that, that's uh, that was, uh, my question. Yeah. My question for Jay Monahan: If I could have been in that press conference, have been Jay, you're giving these players shares in the PGA Tour enterprises. Please explain to me, as if I was a child, how are they going to be able to sell those shares to realize the value? And if they do, what happens to the new players coming up? Are you mysteriously going to create new share classes? Uh, he wouldn't have been able to answer it because we know it's no, a farce. No. He he would give the usual J Monahan def deflection that I've gotten very, very used to. Um, and he probably does, doesn't have the answer to that question anyway. But there's just too many mouths to feed at the PJ Tour. Like, that's – it's always been part of the problem with how that whole structure is set up. Like, they're – they are not really set up to properly compensate the top players, which is no. the whole reason why live golf even came about. It's the whole reason why the PGL was a thing. And that started to come into the either 10 years ago. Like yeah. these are things it, it's something Phil and tiger have been talking about for as long as I can re remember. It's something that like, even going back to like Greg Norman and like Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas before that, like this has all been coming. Like, these top guys needed to realize more of their value. They're finally starting to do that. The establishment is pissed. They hate the fact that they're getting this money, which is part of the reason why they've been so like trying to, all, to, <laughs> to box them out at like every turn. So, um, and I think that we're getting to the point, hopefully where people just accept that this is the new way that it is. And if you want to be part of that class of player, there's one place to be part of that class of player where you're going to be, properly compensated for the value that you bring. And then there's another one that's totally the models, more old school meritocracy, you know, legacy and tradition, all that crap that we've heard for many, many years from, from the PJ tour. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that, but it's legacy just a totally different concept. His legacy and tradition gouging out massive holes in the fairway and smashing tee boxes. I'm just checking. I, don't, I look up legacy and tradition in the dictionary, and I don't get a picture of people gouging fairway be. pieces. <laughs> There's definitely people that have been doing that for a while, but uh, that is where having more cameras on the course 100% uh, catches that. There's definitely been players that have had really, really bad attitudes. Even, my, my, uh, my even though I, I love him to death, Sergio <laughs> Garcia is one of the worst. Yeah, Sergio, so, and I, I'll call out when Sergio did it. So, I yeah. I cannot find any where Hatton broke that putter. I I watched I watched seven holes and the the had played. I watched seven holes he had played to see if I yeah. could find him on the catch up cam. See what happened to that putter. <clears throat> so I'm thinking he broke it on a bag, not on the ground. No problem. I just want to say something. My favorite comment that post I put up about um about Wyndham smashing the ground and it just went went viral like 500,000 views something ridiculous and um my favorite reply was poor old Wyndham imagine actually having a shot shown on the PGA tour <laughs> it's normally adverts <laughs> yeah that's true he got really, he got really unlucky not to be a commercial they don't, break yeah, yeah they, I'm I'm shocked they didn't cut away to like another commercial immediately that would that would have been you know that would have saved him a little bit of a, a little bit of issues but no. So bad, we're, ne we're now time. on. Let's just talk about what I'm calling the PGA Tour's big problem. And I don't mean the tour, I mean the players. Scotty Scheffler, 16 out of 16 out of 16 putts inside of 15 feet. 
it's an all as an apparently it's an all time PGA Tour record. Now, I I when that when I see these records, or someone someone else say it wasn't the PGA Tour record because of an opposing opposing whatever. There was a few things that said it wasn't. But regardless whether it was an all time record Doesn't or it matter. was one of the two all time records, sixteen yep. out of sixteen putts inside of fifteen feet is absolutely incredible. Yeah. He knows those greens really well. He's won there before. He has confidence there. That means a lot. Um, I think that he, uh, like, <laughs> I've had this conversation with a lot of people the last, you know, probably year, thinking that, that he had the yips with, with the putter. I didn't think it it had anything. It, it wasn't a mental problem. It, it was a physical problem where his putter, I mean, sometimes you, you just get so uh, comfortable with a putter you're not lined up properly like you're I could tell his uh, feet and his shoulders were never really aligned to where they needed to be. It was always off a little bit. So it makes it really hard to start the ball. Even if you have the read right, it makes it very hard to actually start the ball online and have it go where you want it to go. So that was a really big issue for him. And <laughs> Rory suggested about a month ago, he's like, yeah, Scotty Scheffler needs needs to go to a mallet putter. Rory's going to this the same tailor made Spider X putter that I have also used. It's a great putter. I will say that. Shout out to Tailor Made. Um, no it's free not. ads though. So it's not. <laughs> but <laughs> but it is a great putter. It is a it's great not. putter, especially it, I, for I, someone I've that's struggling. It. I've used it and I find it's yeah. got like a soft feel to it that I don't like. So for yeah. me, it's not a great putter. Some no. people quite like that soft feel. Yes. I, quite, I, I like a bit of response in the hands. Which is hmm. why I got rid of my Odyssey, and now yeah. I've moved. Now I've moved to the milled face one that I've got. But yeah, everyone, yeah. everyone's different, aren't they, on that putter feel? Yeah, because he uh, he had a milled face putter for a long time. Sometimes it just takes you gotta you gotta try something different. Like if you're struggling with your putter, that's why there's so many so many grips. There's so there's the claw grip. There's uh the sort of left hand low like there's standard grips there's the big grips there's the thin ones there's all sorts of things you can do if you're struggling with your putting the most important thing is you have to keep an open mind to it if you're struggling and you have to be you have to be willing to try other things scotty finally tried something new and voila like he's all of a sudden he became the best putter on the ppj tour almost overnight so I think that there's always things that people need to keep in mind. They, I know people get loyal to like certain putters. Like obviously Tigers have been loyal to a Scotty camera for a long time. Um, I've been on the block that he needed to get rid of that putter a long time ago. As you get older, you need something with a little bit more weight to it. Um, that's just sort of my perspective. Like I will always advise people to try new things. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad that he did it. I'm glad that he's playing well. It's a good time of year for him to start playing well and putting well. We'll have to see how long, uh, if this is just like a honeymoon period or if it actually has staying power, because that's the one question. You can always have a good putting week here and there, even if you're a bad putter. The question is, is this going to, is he going to be able to maintain it for the season? And I put up a post yesterday, so obviously he's had one win this season, over under 5.5 for the year. I think that's high. I think that's really high. I th I think he can get to a three or four. I think getting to six is like is like a whole nother category. Like I mean, look, we are looking at a and people hate it when I say this, but yeah, we are looking at a diluted PGA. Tour. It's, 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 it yeah. is in inarguably a weaker PGA tour field. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Which which is part of the reason why uh it's possible. Um, I still think that, uh, like, we just have to see if this is something that uh, he's going to be able to maintain or not. Because if, if he's not able to main, maintain this, like, uh, it was just a good week. It was a, a place there was one yeah, in the past if, where he has he comes out, Yeah, if he comes out and runs seven by and leaves four short in the first 11 holes, then, yeah, we're, we're, we're back we're back on to Scott. He's got issues with the putter. Right, last <laughs> and not least is the return of Anthony Kim. So, it's been confirmed that Anthony Kim has not had his clubs fitted. And I actually heard Crazy. something I thought I heard something was was amazing. And and I really loved this. And 
there's no absolutely no criticism in what I'm about to say. It's actually admiration and love for what's going on. It was like someone had frozen and thawed out a man from 500 years ago who saw technology. Yeah. Because he, he didn't know about Trackman. Yeah. He was, had, no, he, had, had no idea about the club, the new club fitting technology. Yeah, he was like he, unfrozen he, caveman he, golfer, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It, it was, it was yeah. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. Like, and I, and I actually think that was really quite sweet. And, and he's now going to get fit and... Um, fit for clubs that he's, he's so he's playing in Macau wants to yep. grind his game a bit more and get his game a bit better and I think that's fantastic and then the idea yeah, is he's, the idea is he gets back to America obviously they've got Doral in two weeks time was it three weeks time two weeks three time. weeks three, three weeks, weeks. got Doral in three weeks so he's got time to get fit and I want people I said in my interview with Chris McKee that's that's, that's knocking around somewhere now that I only spent I spent 15 seconds maximum, maybe 12 seconds with him. And I was introduced to him and said, hello, how are you? And said hello to him. And I said, best of luck. And he said, thank you so much. And he was just really nice. And it seems like everything about him is about family, with his family being present and his friend on the bag. And that's great. He's comfortable with his friend on the bag. But does he now need a real, and real caddy? I don't mean oh, that. Sure. I'm not being rude. Does he now need a trained, a, a yes. top end caddy? Yes, because you need someone that knows the uh, the rules. Number number one, because his caddy, there were a few. Oh, he didn't know the drop that... rule, did he? He didn't know the drop no. rule wasn't shoulder height. Well, no. he thought he didn't know his knee height. I know. <laughs> it's things like like that. There, there's also the fact that if he had a, a professional caddy, like there were uh, several times, especially in Jeddah, where he could have gotten TIO relief. Um, if he had an experienced caddy, the one, he, the one he had to lace through the trees and sling it and sling it around the around the yeah. TV tower, he could have easily gotten relief and not have yeah. it. He didn't have to hit that. He shot. could have gone like six clubs to the right and not been in the trees. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Which is like a good caddy can uh, can easily save you two, three shots around, and I think that's the difference between him, you know, finishing in last place and sort of finishing in the middle of the pack. I think that his talent is clearly there. I think that his putting hasn't left them, hasn't left them after twelve years. Like that's the one thing that's been pretty impressive. Like his short putting, like he's missed like one or two here here or there, but overall he saved a lot of pars from really bad spots uh, because he's he's been really dialed from that six to twelve foot range, which is like critical. So if he starts to like raise the other levels of his game, like he gets properly fitted, um, he starts getting comfortable with his equipment, which is a very important thing. Um, and you couple that with, uh, you know, maybe one of the best putters of the last 15 years. Like, I mean, I think you could see some interesting stuff from Anthony Kim towards the, the back half of the season. So I wouldn't be su surprised if he had, you know, like a couple top tens or like, you know, top 15s or something. And I will say, the last thing I'll say on the Anthony Kim thing is that he's obviously been through some things. Oh, for sure. And that's, that's going to come out. Yeah, at is. some point, and there's, there's lots of rumors and lots of people making comments about his appearance and this, that, and the other. And of I course. find it so utterly classless. Yeah, we all have different lives we lead and things we go through. And I am amazed every day at the nastiness of social media <laughs> and the horrible comments about people's appearance and about saying this has happened to them, this has happened to them, and. I just don't know where the kindness has gone, Jay, and it really pisses me off because these people, they wouldn't say it to their face. They no, say of they not. would. They say they would, no. but they, they'd, have a, they'd have a ball out, a glove out, and a pen asking for an autograph. And, That's and, I, why... and I find this faceless <laughs> anger and bullying so pathetic. It's just horrible. Just be nice. You might not like AK playing on Liv. I don't care. But there's no reason to be nasty. And Jay, he's going to tell his story. Yeah. And it's going to be yeah. good to hear. But let him tell his story when he wants to tell it. Yeah. Except this is this is also part of the reason why I've been very adamant about, about this. This is part of the reason why I've, again, tried to stop responding to as many haters as I can. Because a lot of this sentiment is not real. A lot of this stuff on Twitter, like these 
really nasty opinions and such. They're just not real. They're, I mean, a lot of them are fake, the fake accounts. A lot of them are troll accounts. Uh, it very rarely comes from accounts that are sort of um, have names and faces attached to them. They specifically log on to these these platforms to be nasty so that they can get out some of these frustrations from uh, their normal lives that, that may not be that great. So and it's a realization that I've come to over the course of time, which is totally fine, like as we've become a little bit more. Uh, sort of public figures like it's something that we have to be prepared for um, and it's definitely something that i've seen um and except like i said you have to take a lot of this with, with a grain of salt uh, people are going to be mean people are going to be nasty uh there's never really any uh, excuse for it like as as much as i've gone hard after people like i've never um it's just not something that like interests me <laughs> to be that uh sort of cruel or sort of mean spirited because it's just not um it isn't necessary so it's something that i've uh obviously taken a step back from and it's if something that fun, i think everybody like, else needs to keep that perspective sorry i talked over you sorry mate i if we want to have fun That's i could read some i could read some of the comments from some that, I, that i've received recently uh, some of these are great um fat bold ugly prick that was a nice one um you're ugly and have never had a woman. That's a lovely one. What's wrong with your face? This isn't, this is about me. I know this is amusing me. <laughs> no woman's ever slept with you. Like, it, like it's bizarre. It's absolutely, <laughs> honestly, it's, it's thoroughly bizarre. It's ridiculous. Um, you're just a little child. What's wrong with you? You're a pussy. <laughs> you're pathetic. So is your face. <clears throat> This is one of my favorite. You're a failed golf pro. Go get better. Never try to be a golf pro. You're a moron. Like, <laughs> honestly, that's, that's just some of the stuff I get. Because wow. and that, that was because I said I thought Wyndham Clark was wrong for smashing a club into the ground. <laughs> like, that's just, that's just some of them. And I, I just, uh, it just, I don't get it. Like, why are, you, why are people so angry? Oh, one of my favorites, I can't quite, I can't, I can't, I can't quite remember, which was, Mm -hmm. have you given up your job because you're never going to make money with 300 youtube 302 youtube followers <laughs> i think i saw that one i and, or it and, might and be I, the I, same I, one commenting on on my stuff too yeah, yeah. And, I, and i wrote back saying thanks for subscribing and, and and joining in the algorithm he said every penny helps pathetic weasels like you i'm like what is wrong with people like mm -hmm. i don't like coffee right i hate coffee i think it tastes vile I've never gone onto a coffee supporters page and written, you are pathetic, you're ugly for liking coffee. What's wrong with people? Yeah, here, here's what I want, want you to do, though. We need to Star Trek because this is something that I, that I did in 2022. You need to randomly track, like, I don't know, 50 to 100 of these comments that you're getting now. Go back in 6 to 12 months, uh, 6 to 12 months from now. See if those accounts still exist. Because that's something that I did in 2022. And guess what? Most of those accounts don't exist anymore. That tells you something about what's really going on behind the scenes. Yeah, well, look, it makes me laugh. And like, I have comments about you must be broke to be going to work for live. And other people go in, you must be rich to take yourself out to Jed. I'm like, like, I don't like. What I love is that the in, I get I get insults on both sides of the coin. I'm like, can you two have a chat with each other and work out what you're cross about? Because like I haven't got time for it. Yeah, that's why some of it, like like I, I said, I don't even want to give this you know too much uh, too much traction because a lot of it's fake and and I don't want it to impact the things that we say, the things that we do, and me, uh, like even given it the two minutes that we have, like it's probably two minutes too many. So it probably which is part is, of the reason why it, it, look, just, it just made me laugh because those people, those people won't be listening to this, but our yeah. regular listeners who've got to know us are going to laugh at some of those comments for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and look, I've, I've got to pass some of this accountability on to the, the PJ tour, the golf media, their media partners, because they could have put a stop to, they could have tried to, to put a stop to some of this negativity a year ago, two years ago, and they have refused to do it. They've only made this divide worse. They have only made it nastier. 
Um, and look, we just got got to be prepared for it. Like I have been uh, prepared for this from the beginning. This is, and I know you hate, hate me talking about it, but uh, being a fan of Duke basketball, that's like the most hated uh, college basketball team here in the United States. I've had to hear this for 20 years, even from family members that that want to like, like come at, <laughs> come at me with, you know, negativity. And it's like, that's only made me stronger. And uh, like, if, if people think negative comments are, are going to like impact me in like a way that's going to like make me sh- shrink away from that, they've got another thing coming. But let, let's call it, let's call it quits there. Cause I need to go to bed. Um, all I'll say is, I would like some of the insults to be consistent. I get accused of being a lefty. I get accused of being a righty. I think they mean politically not handed. Um, but it, it's just so funny. Look, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Jay and I and for indulging our five-minute moan at the end there. And I look forward to seeing the comments on the YouTube to this because <laughs> I'm sure that some <laughs> people are weighed in with some very funny insults. Um I'd rather you didn't, but if you do, that's entirely up to you. <laughs> but thank you, everybody, uh, for your time. Um, really sad that Mark couldn't be with us today. He's got a big issue with his car, and it meant he can't join us. He is very he he is the heartbeat of this show. You get to see Jay and I and our pretty faces. Well, my ugly, pathetic one, and Jay's other ugly one. But um, without Mark, this show wouldn't exist. So it, it's it's a big shout out to Mark and all he does. And on that. We are desperately trying to keep raising money to pay for a product producer to help take some of that work off a of mark. So if you want to support the show or you'd like to be a sponsor, please head over to glugc.com forward slash support. And you have got the ability to sign up to our members and friends page. You can you can down you can donate either a one off donation or ten dollars a month. And we have we have two sponsorship packages up there, one at 250 a month, or is it 200 and the other at 500 a month for different sponsorship packages. Look, we'd love to get some more sponsors on board um, to get another, sorry, get another sponsor on board and to get some more members because that helps alleviate the workload for Mark and for myself and for Jay and trying to put this show together. Because while we've recorded for an hour and two minutes and 11 seconds now, there is about six other hours after this that goes into it. And yep. if we can help raise a bit of money, help fund the show a little bit, that'll allow some of that strain to be taken away and maybe us produce some more content. We've got some great ideas, but there's only so much time we've got to edit. And if we can get some more money in for editing, then we'll be able to bring you more content. So if you yep. would like to either join, be a friend, be a supporter, or be a sponsor, let us know. The other thing um, I want to add on to uh, to that. Anybody watching this on YouTube, make sure to like this, subscribe it. I know I sound like a YouTuber saying that, but it is important. Um, and then also, if you're listening, uh, even if you're not listening to this, if you're watching this on YouTube, go on Spotify, go on Apple, leave a five star review, leave a comment, positive comment. Um, I personally have a lot of haters that have instead of reviewing our podcast, they uh, review me like it's some sort of social credit thing. So that was my favorite um, one. That was my favorite yeah. one. That one star review. Jay's dreadful. I don't like him. Okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, that wasn't. Yeah, there, there's definitely some others. So we need to sort of drown that that out. We need to sort of pump up the um, algorithm here. You guys can can certainly help help that. Go on Spotify. Go on Apple. Give us five stars. Subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Like this video. It'll definitely help us out too. And that's it. Good night. Take care. Goodbye.